Welcome to the 24th annual Miami Jewish Film Festival, one of the world's largest and oldest Jewish cultural arts events. We want to thank all of our members, sponsors, community partners, volunteers, and all of you film lovers, and especially our presenting sponsors, the Center for the Advancement of Jewish Education and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support through all, throughout all of these years. My name is Lisa Siegel. I am the cantor of Temple Beth Shalom of Miami Beach, and I'm very excited to be moderating a virtual conversation with the writer of the book and screenplay, Martin Goldsmith, from the movie Winter Journey, which is premiering at this year's festival. So thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you for honoring me with this conversation. I was so incredibly moved by this beautiful tribute to your father. And of course, as a cantor, I really appreciate the immense contributions of Jewish musicians and know many stories of uh, what they provided during this very dark period in our history with their talent and their perseverance. Um, and so I just wanted to go ahead, if you're OK, Martin, just ask you some of my questions that I took away from watching the film. What was your impetus for sharing your father's moving story with us? Well, it was a matter of, um, it, the, the film is called Winter Journey, which um, relates to a song cycle by Franz Schubert. Um, but in fact, it it's, was sort of the culmination of a journey that I took uh, over many decades to learn the story of my uh, of my family's history. Um, I knew that uh, my parents were part of an all Jewish orchestra in Nazi Germany. Germany. Um, I was aware of that fact, but I had no idea of the, the story behind it. And it took me a while to begin to ask my father the questions that led to the book. The Inextinguishable Symphony, which led to the movie Winter Journey, but it was it was uh, just a, a voyage of discovery for me. And I, I recall it, um, that the the trip that you made with your father was in 1996, I believe. Well, which that was, yeah, trip? that was the second. Was that the second trip you made? I'm sorry, I guess I don't understand a, a trip I made. The I visit my father in the film i'm visiting my father where he lived in tucson arizona and right. but i'm talking about you made one or two trips with your dad back because it showed you back to germany oh i understand yes well in 1962 when i was 10 my parents traveled to germany for the first mm -hmm. time since they had uh, escaped germany in 1941 so it had it had been 21 years since they'd been in Germany. And I was 10 years old at the time. And uh, I recall that we first visited my mother's old house in uh, the German city of Dusseldorf. And then we drove to Oldenburg, which is a mid-sized town in the northwestern part of Germany. And uh, we had visited my mother's house in Dusseldorf, and we were planning to do the same in Oldenburg. But as we got closer to the house, my father just drove slower and slower and finally turned away and, and, and left the city as fast as he could, saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I can't do that. And that was, that was the first time I'd been in Germany with my father. Right. Um, but then many years later, about 30 years later in 1992, when I was 40, I met my father in Oldenburg and he showed me his father's grand house, uh, which he was forced to sell by the Nazis. Um, and he showed me where his father's woman's clothing store had been. And that further primed the pump of my interest in finding out where I came from and who my family was. And that, that really started the, uh, the process going much more quickly. Right. And so it was very evident, you know, and, and, and I was wondering if you could comment about just what was the process of getting your father to open up about this dark period in his life? What, I mean, cause it seemed like a real journey getting there. 
not to not to uh, skip to the end, but my uh, my father lost virtually his entire family in the Holocaust, right. and he found it very very painful to to talk about uh, anything um, relating directly to his family. Uh, he spoke more freely about uh, this extraordinary arts organization my parents were part of, the Judicial Kulturbund, the Jewish Cultural Association. He shared with me his memories of performing with that ensemble. And he was very voluble about certain things, uh, sometimes to my embarrassment. He uh, talked to me about the first time, as he put it, your mother and I made love. Oh, and I it was said, in the movie, eh, it was in the movie, right. Too much, too much information, thanks. Right. <laughs> um, but other other aspects of his life, he claimed not to re not to recall, such as the fact that in when in 1926 he was bar mitzvahed. He claimed not to remember that, right? Which struck me as How could unbelievable, you... right. Um, right? So right. some things he, he he spoke about very uh, very easily and eagerly, and some things he found difficult, if not impossible, right. And so the whole the whole process of getting the story centers around your father. And I just was wondering um, about your mother. Did she? Did you ever? I mean, did she? Did she share anything with you? As you know, I was just curious about that because that wasn't really part of the story. Well, in the the the, the movie recounts some of the conversations I had with my father in 1994. Uh, in 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 Tucson, um, my mom had been dead for ten years. She she died in 1984. Before I really began my quest, uh, so while I had, had asked her about her father, who had been her first teacher, she um, I, I I didn't give her a chance to tell me any stories because I I still wasn't in the place where I could ask the questions. Right. Okay. And tell me about the, um, I just was really taken by the, the black and white footage and the cinematography and, you know, and w was, was it actual footage that, or, did, or was it replicated or part, you know, part of both? I mean, it was incredible what you had. Well, all credit to Honoris Ostergaard, the director of the film. Um, yes, he and his co-director, uh, Erjbet, um, scoured all manner of archives for uh, documentary footage. And there are photographs of real people. Uh, Hans Hinkel, who was uh, Joseph Goebbels' assistant overseeing the Kulturbund, and photographs of Goebbels himself, and photographs of Adolf Hitler and... and uh, but there are also, uh, and, and there, there's a archival photographs of the Kulturbund Orchestra with uh, both of my parents visible in the mm -hmm. shot. Um, and there's a photograph of my mother's house in Dusseldorf where my father fled after Kristallnacht. But there are also um, photographs of um, generic World War I soldiers when uh, my father is telling me fact that his father fought in the First World War. Um, and there are other sort of generic shots. Um, Honoris Ostergaard likes to work in a uh, fashion that in the publishing world is known as narrative nonfiction, which is to say that everything is in fact uh, factually true, but uh, there are certain aspects of the story that are are dramatized. So uh, the part of my father, who died uh, 10 years ago, is played by the remarkable Swiss actor Bruno Gantz, uh, best known for uh, Wings of Desire, I would imagine, and of course his, uh, his role of Adolf Hitler in the film Downfall about mm. a dozen years ago. So yeah, the, these conversations between my father and me, uh, I, I have the the great uh, good fortune of having my father played by one of the greatest actors of his time. Beautiful, beautiful. And your father, did he did he know about this? Did he understand before he died? Did he ever 
know what was going to be i mean did, you know it was a little vague I, did, did he know what was going to be the end result or did did you know at that time that it was well, going to be a movie no i i the book was published on nearly 21 years ago in in 2000 uh and it was only about five years ago that honor sostergaard uh emailed me and told me of his interest in making the book into this documentary film mm -hmm. so no my, my 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 father did not know about the film he knew about the book right okay. in Inextinguishable symphony and and uh, we had some talks about that wonderful um and how about this the jewish cultural association who was the primary audience at that time for them were, were they i mean who was who was attending during this time well it it goes back to uh shortly after adolf hitler became chancellor of germany on january 30th 1933 um the nazis had many things on their plate many things they wanted to accomplish but as it happens one of the first things they did do was to evict jewish artists from german operas opera companies, theater companies, and orchestras. So by the early spring of 1933, there were just dozens of unemployed Jewish artists, and they came together to form this Kulturbund, this cultural association, reasoning that if they could no longer make art for their fellow Germans, they could make art for their fellow German Jews. So to perform with the Kulturbund, to be an actor, or a violinist or a flutist or a costume designer or someone who built sets backstage or cleaned the lavatories to, to do anything with Kulturban, you had to be Jewish and to attend Kulturban performances, you had to be Jewish. Got it. Um, you had to, um, you were encouraged to become a subscribing member. And at the height of the Kulturban, uh, 1935, 1936, there were more than 75,000 uh, registered members of the Kulturbund in about 40 German cities. Mm. So it was very much a restricted, uh, one might say, ghettoized organization, but it was it was hardly uh, Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland, hey kids, let's put on a show sort of organization. Some of the very finest actors in uh, German theaters were again evicted, and so they became members of the Kulturbund. Uh, some of the finest uh, musicians in Germany became Kulturbund members. Um, the conductor of the Frankfurt Kultur Kulturbund was a man by the name of Hans Wilhelm Steinberg. He later emigrated first to Palestine and then to the United States. And under the name William Steinberg, he was the music director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the Buffalo Philharmonic Pittsburgh Symphony. Um, there, there was a, a film maybe eight years ago, an Israeli film called Walk on Water and um, it was a story about a Mossad plot to assassinate an old Nazi. And the old Nazi was, ironically enough, played by a former member of the Kulturbund. Uh, so there, there were, there were, it was a very, very fine organization. And, and how were the musicians and staff treated, you know, behind the scenes? Well, it was, not only allowed to come into existence, but it was encouraged. I briefly a while ago mentioned a man by the name of Hans Hinkel. He worked in what was called the Ministry for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, headed by Minister Joseph Goebbels. And um, Hans Hinkel met with Kurt Singer, a man who had been the director of the German opera in Berlin before he was kicked out in 1933. And he, uh, Kurt Singer, found this fellow Hans Hinkel and told him his idea for this German Jewish uh, organization. And Hans Hinkel immediately took the idea to his boss, Goebbels, realizing that it could be a potent propaganda tool uh, when other countries around the world, to the extent that they did, uh, began protesting the stories that they heard about the way the Jews were being treated in Germany, Goebbels was able to say, well, look, they have their own opera company, their own orchestra. Correct. Uh, right. Would we be treating them this well if, if we were really um, making life hard for them? So it was it a was propaganda tool, and the Kulturbund performed 
um, with the express blessing of the Nazis. So those people who were in the Kulturbund uh, had a certain degree of protection that that other non-artists didn't have. Interesting. Okay. And I, I actually, I was just thinking about this also. I, tell me a little bit about um, the that um, how he when he left and went to America. Um, tell me about that that whole that journey. Um, Kurt tell me Singer. about that. Yeah. Yes. Well, Kurt Singer um, was a pretty amazing guy. Um, he uh, again was he conducted the German Opera Company in Berlin. He was a former neurologist and uh, something of an expert on, on many aspects of music. He was the dynamic leader of the Kulturbund. My father uh, admitted to me that he was always a little bit afraid of Kurt Singer. Uh -huh. not, not that Singer was a disciplinarian or anything like that, but that he, he knew what he wanted to do and um, was unsparing in his efforts to, to make things happen. As it happened in in uh, the fall of 1938, uh, Kurt Singer, realizing that more and more Jews had emigrated from Germany, therefore reducing the number of artists in the Kulturbund and reducing the number of potential audience members, he realized the Kulturbund needed some kind of boost. So he actually went to America to uh, um, negotiate what he hoped to be some performances by the Kulturbund Theater Company in New York. And that's where he was on November 9th, 1938. So the uh, infamous uh, Kristallnacht, the, yes, the, the pogrom uh, that was called by the Nazis the Night of Broken Glass. Right. Um, and he immediately caught the first ship back to Europe. Uh, but on the way, he... Um, seemed to get cold feet. He wrote this long letter to uh, his colleagues in the Kulturbund saying how uh, as much as he wished he'd, he could be there with them now, uh, the current situation was too perilous. And so he stayed in Amsterdam where his ship landed. And in 1940, when the Nazi army overran the Low Countries, Kurt Singer was uh, taken prisoner and sent to the so-called model concentration camp in Theresienstadt or Terezin, where he died of malnutrition in the winter of 1941-42. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Tell me about post all of this and your dad's in, in, uh, in the United States and he just, did he just give up, both, both your parents, did they just give up playing? I mean, did they totally give up music? My mother did not. She was um, a, a very fine violist. Right. When, when they first came to this country, um, my father got a job playing in the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. My father played the flute. He played in the Baltimore Symphony while my mother uh, played a season with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Fritz Reiner. Uh, then they both spent a season playing in the New Orleans Philharmonic. And then at the very outset of 1946, my mother auditioned for the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and she was uh, accepted and offered a p position in the viola section of the St. Louis Symphony. My father went with her to St. Louis where he uh, began selling furniture in a department store right. called Famous Bar, it's parenthetically if uh, any of uh, our viewers remember the marvelous play the glass menagerie by tennessee williams uh amanda wingfield demonstrates brassiers at famous bar oh. i might i like to say that my father worked at the same store as amanda wingfield right. but uh he never again played the flute and uh as it happens in the very beginning of 1946 is when those first grisly newsreels uh began being shown in the united states uh, of President Eisenhower and other people uh, liberating the the camps, yes. and um, we see these horrible skeletal remains of of the living and the heaps of the dead. And 
I posited in the book that it was uh, an act of penance for my father to give up uh, the flute, something he really loved. Um, and I asked him about that after the book was published, and he said, I cannot disagree with anything you, you wrote about that subject. So my father, um, who, based on an interview I did with another Kulturbund member, the youngest member of the Kulturbund, a man by the name of Henry Meyer, according to Henry, my father was the life of the party back in, in Berlin. He was the first you know, to suggest going out to get something to eat after a concert. Uh, he would always buy the flowers for somebody's birthday. He was a good dancer. 180 degrees from the man I knew as my father. I think he, wow. he learned that his father and his younger brother and his mother and his younger sister were all murdered during the, uh, the Holocaust. And he was consumed with guilt for having not, not for not being able to save them. And uh, so he left a life of music for a, a life of commerce that he did not enjoy at all. Right. And which you definitely, you know, that was a, that, that kind of really like pierced my heart when that, when you, you as the character talked about that in the movie, you know, saying that your father never, you know, liked the furniture business. I mean, that was a really poignant moment that you put into the movie. Can you just talk about that and why? And Well, it, it, yes, I, um, I'm sure you've, uh, you, you know, other two G's, uh, second generation yes. uh, people. And uh, <laughs> um, we, we, we seem to have a, a similar story, all of us, right. that in that we obviously love our parents, but uh, from an early age, realize that there's some, there, something happened in the past that we really can't bring up as, as, as a discussion. Um, I actually attend a, a second generation uh, group every month and we talk about these sorts of things. And one of the members of the, of the group recalled that when she was about seven years old, she fell off her bicycle and really badly skinned her knee and she ran off or limped off towards her parents' house crying. But she said, before I got to my front door, there was something in me, you know, at seven years old, there was something in me that realized that a skinned knee could never begin to uh, compare to what her parents had suffered and what her family had lost. So she just snuck up to, uh, to the bathroom and cleaned her, her knee off herself right. and never said anything about it. Right. Um, yeah, that says a lot, yeah. And, and so when I'm talking to my father towards the end of the film, um, I allow my pity for him and my frustrations with him to sort of boil over. A, I, I was aware of how much he hated uh, the phony pep talks and sales meetings of the furniture store. And uh, I, at the time, I didn't understand why he had given up his flute. But then there is sort of a denouement in the film and we find out why. Mm, yeah, it was really quite a, a moment. Um, yeah. Any, I'm curious, any talent handed down, musical talent handed down to... Well, hundreds of years ago, I, I took the requisite piano lessons, uh, but I would rather go outside and play baseball than sit at the piano. I played the French horn in high school. I was a pretty good 13-year-old French horn player. And then in college, I was in the chorus of the Baltimore Opera Company for three years. Um, but I never, whatever talent I might have, I never worked at. So. Uh, okay. So... Um, tell me, how has your father's story affected your own connection to your Jewish heritage? I did not know that I was a Jew, really, until I was about 16. Wow, um, really? Uh, 
My father would say we were of, quote, Jewish background, unquote. We attended something called the Ethical Society in St. Louis, uh, where all four of us would drive downtown um, on a Sunday morning, and my parents would uh, be in the main auditorium downstairs listening to very earnest uh, talks about nuclear disarmament and civil rights. And my brother and I would go upstairs and we'd sing these nice uh, liberal songs, Gedankens in Frei, Thoughts Are Free. Uh, so we, we grew up at, you know, in, a, in a nice liberal Jewish household, except it wasn't Jewish. Um, I, no holiday observances? No, 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 well, we well, guess we, we, we uh, celebrated Christmas with the Tannenbaum, with a Christmas tree. How interesting. Um, so then we moved to Cleveland uh, in 1967 when I was 15. My mother joined the Cleveland Orchestra. And we, we settled in the uh, Cleveland suburb of Shaker Heights, which is like 90% Jewish. Jewish. So all of my friends in, in school were Jewish. And so that, that first April, um, I was invited to a Seder, my very first Seder. And um, it was all sort of strange to me and nice and wonderful and welcoming at the same time. And then it was actually a few years after that, I went to see the movie Cabaret with Eliza, Liza Minnelli and Joel Gray and Michael York. And I walked out of the film realizing that it had something to do with my family's life. But as I say, it, it wasn't until much later that I began asking these questions. And, but it, it has definitely strengthened my uh, self-awareness of being a Jew. And uh, actually now, 12 or 13 years ago, I started a 20 month course of study that resulted in my becoming a bar mitzvah boy at oh, age 55. Wonderful. So I became a man at 55. Wonderful, beautiful, love that story. Beautiful, beautiful. I was, that was my, that was my I actually was gonna ask, and when you said 16, you didn't know you were a Jew. I, I was gonna ask, were you, did you have a bar mitzvah? That's beautiful. Um, so, so, so just, you know, I guess the, I guess my last question is just, you know, so you, you're ta you've, you've had more of a connection to, you know, this connected you more Jewishly, but you know, how about just what has this done for you spirit in a spiritual sense and in a, in a, just a, you know, how has she, you know, between the book and the movie, what has this done for you as a person? How has it changed you? How has it enlightened your life? And, um, and, and w again, you know, to us, why is this story so important to tell? When my father died at age 95 in uh, 2009, um, I obviously was, was shaken. I, I was now an orphan. Uh, since my mom had died. Um, but then almost exactly, in fact, 11 months later to the day, my brother died of a heart attack. And I realized that I was you know, the last goldsmith standing. So I, I had done, I, I, I knew based on the research I did for my first book, The Inextinguishable Symphony, uh, that my father's father, and my father's younger brother had both been passengers on the ill-fated refugee ship, the St. Louis, mm. which left Hamburg in um, May of 1939, uh, bound for Cuba. But it was turned away from Cuba, from the United States and from Canada. And the ship then sailed back to Europe where a, a deal was, was made whereby the refugees on board the St. Louis could um, disembark in either England, France, Belgium, or Holland. My grandfather and uncle got off the boat in France and were sent to a displaced persons camp. And this was June, 1939. And they were in, in, at this fairly idyllic camp in uh, the town of Martigny-les-Bains in sort of central Eastern France. Um, and there they were until 
September 1st of 1939, which is when the Second World War began. And my relatives metamorphosed overnight in the eyes of their French captors, uh, metamorphosed from displaced persons to enemy aliens. And they spent the next three years being shuttled from one camp to another in France uh, and occupied Germany um, or German occupied France until they were sent to Auschwitz in August of 1942. And after my my father and brother died, I decided that I, I just sort of needed to know more of my family story. So I, I in 2011, which goodness now is 10 years ago, um, I traveled from each camp to another to uh, breathe the air that they had breathed and to tell their story and to, to bear witness. I began in Sachsenhagen, a little town in, in lower Saxony where my grandfather was born and went to all the camps and all the places they had been held captive on, and followed the, uh, the, uh, the journey to the Polish town of Oswiczem, which in German is Auschwitz. Uh, and I documented that in my second book about my parents and my family called Alex's Wake. So um, it, what, has, what has been the effect of, of these books? Well, it, it, it drew me closer to my family. It drew me closer to, I mean, it reinforced ideas I had about uh, the importance of uh, a good moral country taking in refugees and not building walls, uh, but you know, extending hands instead. Mm -hmm. um, I think it made me a better citizen. Uh, it certainly made me appreciate life uh, in perhaps ways I, I might not have otherwise. It was, it was a good journey for me. And I, I like to think that um, reading these books would be a, a, a good, good journey for for most people. Yeah, I would yeah, I listen it's a, it's a it's a sacred journey and I so appreciate it. I know I speak for everyone for you know how important it is that you shared this journey and that it you know that it brought you such a wonderful sense of satisfaction and and hopefully a sense of healing and renewal, you know, from everything from what It you did and 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 this film um is I mean it's it's it tells a sad story but it tells a, a true and honest story. Right. And um, the story of the Kulturbund is one that most people probably don't know about. Oh, right. um, so I, and to see my father depicted by Bruno Gans, it was just, I expected that Bruno Gans would take me aside when we met and he would say, tell me everything you can about, about your father. Did he walk this way? Did he smoke a pipe? Uh, were there, but he wanted, wanted nothing to do with any of that. He just created the character of George Goldsmith out of his, out of the script and out of his own genius as an actor. And though he never asked me anything about how my father would move or speak or anything like that, there are times in the film that I forget it's an actor because he is, he just inhabits my father in such a way that it was almost eerie. Amazing, amazing. I'm sure he was very moved by the story as well. Wow. Well, I just really want to thank you, Martin, from the bottom of my heart so very much. Um, and thank all of our listeners for, for this interview um, and for viewing this very, very important um, story, The Winter Journey. And I want to once again thank you, say thank you to all of our members and our sponsors, community partners, volunteers, all of you film lovers, and especially our presenting, pound, part, um, our presenting sponsors, the Center for the Advancement of Jewish Education, SAGE, and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support throughout all of these years. And thank you so much to our audience for participating in the annual 24th annual Miami Jewish Film Festival. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kendra Siegel.